Hello and welcome to Bible Study with me, Pastor Seth Bode of Bethlehem Lutheran Church in Carmel, Indiana. It's good to have you here. Today I'm going to be talking about righteousness, so we open with a prayer. Dear Savior Jesus, we thank you that you have paid for our sins and you have loved us enough to sacrifice so much. We thank you for being one of us as true man and also so great and mysteriously beyond us that we can't possibly fathom the good that you have in store for us. Help us to understand and trust your will, what is right and what is wrong, and also help us to understand what you have done on our behalf with holy and perfect righteousness for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so this morning as we talk about righteousness, I want you to think about what's right and what's wrong in this world. What's right and what's wrong. You think about them as a balance on the scales. Okay, how to, how to right and wrong balance, whether for you or for just mankind as a whole. You think about right and wrong on a ladder, you know, a, a right step, upward or a wrong step, a misstep, maybe a step downward, what's right and what's wrong. And then I want you to think about people's personal identities and, and their past and the way they're shaped compared to others, what's right and what's wrong. And if you think about those things, you'll be reminded that None of them are really a right way to think about being right and wrong with God. So here's our introduction. The world may not always admit it, but because it's doing things like that, putting right and wrong on a balance or on a ladder or um, comparatively between people and identity-wise and accomplishment-wise, well, um, everyone has a longing for righteousness. They just show it. They, they prove it. The world out there shows it and proves it by how it acts. How to go about being righteous or apprehending righteousness is actually a different question than whether people are longing for it or not. Most religions, in fact many Christian denominations, teach a gradual righteousness, something that a person must improve every day of the week. What do you think? Is righteousness a person's gradual improvement? Or is it something else? I'd like you to have a group discussion, pause the video, and then when you're finished and you've heard some of your answers, some suggestions, um, we'll go into talking about what righteousness is. So go ahead and pause the video now. Okay, you've finished your discussion. Let's take a look at what the scriptures say. Genesis 15 verse 6. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Habakkuk 2, verse 4. The righteous will live by his faith. This is quoted in Galatians 3, 11 as well. Romans 4, verses 5 and 6. To the man who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. What is righteousness? Well, according, according to the scriptures, it's status before God. When applied to Christians, first and foremost, righteousness is a right status before God, you might say, his disposition towards people. And if God sees you as right, he sees you as someone who has done everything completely right by the law. If God doesn't see you as having done everything completely right by the law, well, then you are wrong. That's the only alternative. As a coach says on TV, if you're not the winner, if you're not gold medalist, if you're not first place, then your second place is just first loser. 
And in that way, this becomes a rather binary thing. You've either completed the works of the law and God sees you that way, or not. And that's very important because when it comes to being saved, only righteous people are saved. There's no gradual process involved then. You see how that really rules out any kind of sanative righteousness, which is what One Great Big Church teaches, or um, a curative, gradual righteousness that can be improved um, as time goes on. If you're not right, then you're wrong. Going on to question number two, sometimes people say that Old Testament people were saved by keeping God's law. But New Testament believers are saved by faith in Jesus' work. Evaluate that statement on the basis of the above passages. So we're going to pause and let you work as a group at your table. So if you can work up the courage to talk to the person next to you, people at, the, at your table, if no one's there, maybe a table nearby, we'll pause it and consider question two now. Okay, I hope this diagram can do a pretty good job of summing up whatever you said at your table. I hope you understood that just because someone's in the Old Testament doesn't mean they have some kind of different faith than the New Testament. The only thing that marks a difference is that the Old Testament faith looks forward to the coming Messiah at Christmas. The New Testament faith looks backward at the Son of God who already has come and has died to take away sins. But for all intents and purposes, it's the same hope of eternal life just as we do, whether Old Testament or New Testament, is through faith in the promised Messiah, Jesus Christ. All right, let's go look at the next smattering of passages so we can finish off these questions. There's not a whole lot today, just six questions. But um, on screen for you, we read 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. God made him, that's Christ, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Romans 1, 17. In the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Romans 3.20 No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Romans 3.22-24 Righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. To all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And Romans 5.19, just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. There you have it. It's a lot to take in. Hopefully you see that they're, these passages are all along the same lines. They're not tongue twisters or riddles, although some of them come out to sound that way. There's some symmetry and some balance, but really these are some of the clearest passages in the entire Bible. Speaking of entireties, we get a sense here and um, pretty explicitly that Jesus has won righteousness for the entire world. How would you explain that to someone who asks, how, how has Jesus won righteousness for the entire world? Take a moment with your groups and discuss question three as we pause the video now. So the point we're driving home here is the reality that Jesus has died for the sins of the whole world. And one reason why that's important is first and foremost, so we don't start setting ourselves on pedestals and feeling superior to others, but also so we're not under the delusion or the 
idea that um, faith somehow conjures up the blessings that Jesus has for us. Otherwise, we might depend on whether we are putting together faith strongly with enough faith puzzle pieces in our heart before God finally says that's good. Um, faith merely apprehends or takes hold of the blessings of righteousness that are won for us on Jesus' cross. So imagine a king rides up to you on a horse next to this castle that you've been marveling at. I don't know if anyone's ever been to Europe to go view the castles. Maybe uh, take in a castle trip is different than a church trip. And there's different genres of castles too that you can go and find. Let's say you find the most beautiful castle you've ever seen. It's not only protective, but it looks like it's pretty cozy inside for royalty. And the king of that castle rides up to you, he shouts, lower the drawbridge, and he says, here's my crown, here's my armor, here's my horse, my, my valiant steed, here are my servants, all those knights who are following behind me, all the foot soldiers, it's all yours, um, you, it's, it belongs to you. Go ahead, all you have to do is sit on this horse and ride across the drawbridge, and, or, or walk the horse, doesn't matter, it's all yours. By believing that the king was generous, that doesn't, that doesn't make those gifts appear out of thin air. The king himself has won those gifts on your behalf. However, it is important to have faith in those gifts because otherwise you just walk away with your hands in your pockets thinking it's all a big scam or something. So faith simply apprehends the blessings of Jesus' righteousness won at the cross for all people at all time. Um, Number four asks us, what did Jesus' perfect life have to do with God's gift of righteousness? And um, that's contrasted in the second question, number four, what did Jesus' suffering and death have to do with God's gift of righteousness? Well, I don't know how familiar you are with Jesus' active obedience. I'm going to write it on the board. And we contrast this with Jesus' passive obedience. If you're active, you're doing the thing. If you're passive, the thing is being done unto you. Jesus' active obedience would be all of the right things that he did to, um, to complete a whole body of righteousness his whole life long. So we know that Jesus was born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under law. And that means that he had to follow the law, even though God, who is love, set the law of love, and um, by his intrinsic nature should not have to follow rules outside of himself. Yet that's what Jesus had to do as true man, because um, humanity is subject to those laws. So this is part of the mystery of the Incarnation. Jesus had to actively obey, that is, be perfect. His perfect actions on our behalf, and his passive obedience were his innocent sufferings. And sometimes, Sometimes people forget the fact that when Jesus actively did something correctly, this too bore forgiveness for our sins because someone needed to do it right in the first place. So when Jesus does kind things, loving things, when he doesn't neglect the weak or the poor, when he, um, when he gives, when he isn't jealous, instead when he speaks lovingly toward a jealous people, all of those things cover over our sins just as much as his innocent sufferings on the cross. So he was already paying for our sins um, as a youth, as a baby, when he was living his life perfectly. So that's what I really want to point out with that. We go into our next 
passage on screen. You can see it as I read it, Romans 9, verses 30 to 32. The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. But Israel, who pursued a law of righteousness, has not attained it. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. We're going to pause the video one more time with this next question. Why didn't the majority of the Jewish people receive God's gift of righteousness? Why did the Gentiles receive it? This may or may not be a very timely question. So we'll pause the video now as you discuss among your friends nearby. Thanks for discussing that. As you see on the board here, we have a helpful explanation. Righteousness is by faith alone. In Paul's experience, what, and he's the one writing the book of Romans, and he had himself been a persecutor of believers and, um, and a Pharisee, of, among Pharisees, trained, trained in the law. So what does he say? Well, in his experience, the Jews were trying to earn it, and so they lost it. This is the one way. If you have this information, this is the one way to lose it. But as it turns out, there's a, a, a myriad of ways that, um, that salvation by works manifests itself. Um, meanwhile, in his experience, the Gentiles were viewing it as a gift, unearned. And so they were apprehending these gifts. They were taking hold of these gifts by faith and not, not viewing it as jealousy, um, as if they wanted to be the Savior instead of Jesus, like many of the Jews saw him, with, viewed him with jealousy as well as his apostles. So it's a beautiful fact that salvation isn't earned. And in fact, you think about that Sabbath day of rest in the Old Testament, what God was trying to teach. Now that culminates in our final Sabbath rest in heaven. But um, the kingdom of glory in heaven starts even now for those who are won by grace because, because we've rested and we've set, it, set aside our own achievements and our own merits, um, which is a, a daily habit that we need to practice. Setting aside all of, all of our opinion of the law, setting it aside because it can't help us in this only faith alone and spirit-wrought faith in our hearts can work. Number six is our last question. What I really want to get into in consecutive Bible studies is the formula of Concord Article 4. So this is kind of a setup. The Lutheran theologians teach us justification is the doctrine upon which the church stands or falls. Why is that true? Well, let me just state it the way that it's been stated in the past. It's the chief article of faith. The chief article of faith. It has to be believed. Uh, you can't work it out. Um, you simply trust it. But in another way to put it as chief article of faith, it's sort of the center of the spokes in the wheel of Christian doctrine. Everything, everything in Christian doctrine supports that and supplies that. Um, and then in turn, it supplies those things because it's the basis for all that we do. Um, it's the reason why we look at the Ten Commandments so we can see what we have done and what we haven't done. And it's the reason why we, um, why we talk about of God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, because that's not something we could have figured out. It had to be done by, had to be sorted out by faith, not by reason. It's the reason we talk about prayer being something not that we earned the conversation with God, but that God earned so that we could talk to Him and so that He could delight in our conversations with Him. Another way of putting it, um, another thing to bring in here is it's the chief issue of the Reformation and has really turned into the chief topic of Christian doctrine even now, if, as it always really was. 
It alone honors the Son completely, therefore it honors the Father. It alone shows the way to unspeakable treasure and the right knowledge of Jesus Christ. It alone opens the door to the Bible, and it alone consoles consciences and satisfies spiritual hunger. That's what justification does. I'll let you think about this question as you go today. What does that mean for the day-to-day -day life of the church? We close with prayer. Dear Jesus, our righteousness, thank you for winning our declaration of innocence in God's court of law. Cause us now to lead righteous lives, rich in good deeds, in order to thank you for your great mercy to us. Amen.